Hi, my name is Brad, and I'm the pastor at Community Fellowship. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering. What you're going to see today is people worshiping God with great music and listening to teaching from the Bible that will help them live their lives. And we're excited about the fact that you're joining with us in that. If you have any questions, please ask them. If you have statements to make, make comments. And if you think this could help people around you, share this video so that others may join us. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'll come back and see you again in the middle and the end of the video. Good morning. I want to share this scripture with you from Psalms. It says, <laughs> I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I have been saved from my enemies. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be to God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. Would you stand with us? as we sing, call upon the Lord.
enough to say Rise, your shackles are no more For Jesus Christ has broken every chain Oh, we sing that We'll call upon the Lord For He alone is strong enough to You know, it's awesome just to, to start our morning with that and it, those promises that God can break every chain, that no matter what stronghold you're facing this morning, and, and I realize that you walk into this room and there are things that maybe you're struggling with or that you're facing, that you're scared of, things that are holding you back or holding you down. Um, and so just remember those promises and that you can call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Hey, we're just going to take a moment while Julie fixes her string and, um, and just greet each other. So find a couple people to hug and um, say hello to them this morning. We have a great crowd this morning, and then we're going to continue to worship. All right, go ahead. Y'all can continue to stand as we continue to worship. Um, you guys probably know this one, this song a little bit better. It's called This Is Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. 
can have a seat and just direct your attention this way to the baptistry um, because we have a baptism which is awesome so amen um, I'm very grateful to be a part of a church that allows parents to baptize their children and uh, it's definitely a wonderful thing Carly, do you have Jesus in your heart? And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And you guys, that was uh, young Miss Carly. We have been so excited that she and so many other um, Young ones are finding faith in Christ, and it's our opportunity as a church to, to not just baptize them, but, but might I dare say more importantly, but to be supportive for them for the rest of their lives. Uh, this isn't just a moment in history. This is the beginning of something beautiful. And we love this young lady, and we love her family, and we love so many other kids here. It's our blessing and our opportunity to take responsibility for them and to love them and to care for them and to discipline them and to teach them and to help them find forgiveness when they've been wrong and to teach them the gospel. That's, that's us. 
It's why we worship together. It's one of the reasons we worship together. It's one of the things God's doing in us. It's one of the reasons we give and worship the Lord financially and, and give to him is that we want to be a part of something bigger than what we are. And so as this next song begins, and you, you can remain seated, our ushers are going to come forward and we'll give you the opportunity to express generosity and to worship the Lord through giving. Let's pray together and ask God to use this offering in beautiful ways. Lord, thank you for Miss Carly, for her family, for the joy that it brings all of us to see the faith that, that you've brought about in her and that she responded to. Father, I pray that you would continue to grow us in our attitude of generosity, that you would continue to help us be people who genuinely care about others, who care about the things that you care about in this world, who let our focus be on things above and not the needless, difficult, short-term things of this life. We trust you, Lord. It is our pleasure to worship you in giving today and in song and in attitude and in heart. In all these things, you are Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, as always, when you're finished giving, if you want to stand back up, join with us, um, feel free. We're just going to sing about the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, and nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus, you brought heaven down. 
come and fill this place. Come and break down the walls in our hearts. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the power in the name of Jesus. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing could compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Sing it. You've tasted.
Jesus, thank you for filling us up, for being among us in this place. Thank you for the rain that reminds us of your, of your renewing the earth and renewing our souls and our hearts. Transform us, God. May we just trust in you today. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here and for doing such a good job leading us in worship and worshiping him. So before I get into today's teaching, which is a little, a little bit heavy and, and serious, uh, I want to talk to you about something that is not heavy and not serious at all. Who was here for the Little Mudder yesterday? Anybody here for the Little Mudder? I saw some Little Mudder garb. I saw some folks wearing the shirts, proving their... There's my son, Jackson, right there. <laughs> yeah, okay, so here's what we have. That is awesome, right there. That is just an awesome... That's a Christmas card, is what that is. I love it. We had just kids from all over the region... Uh, I think that I think the final number of elementary school and and maybe all the way up to middle school children was 132. I think kids that came and ran in the uh, little mutter. We also had probably 15 or 20 teenagers, and then uh, some photos you can find on Facebook if you know where to look. We had about 12, <laughs> about about 12 or 15 adults who took the plunge as well. So uh, and that's not counting the all the mamas who went with their three year olds, like you might see there. So it's just a fantastic day. Uh, we had a blast, and, and some have asked me why we do this, like what's the point, point? And, and I want to be very clear about this. Uh, we had in this event, we had families from all over our region, some of whom go to church here, some of whom are not connected to any church anywhere, and I'm sure some who were connected to other churches in the region. And for whatever reason over time, and we'll talk about this a little bit later today, uh, there are many who have come to believe that churches are filled with people who are stuffy and angry, and frustrated, and proud of themselves, and disappointed in everybody else. And an event like this helps us show that that is not who we are, and that's not who we want to be, and that's not who we will ever be. And so we got to interact with and connect with so many different families. It was an absolute blast. And to Matt, and to Darlene, and to every other adult who helped and served, to all of our teenagers who came and served at different uh, stops and made sure that the kids were safe, we just want to say thank you to all of you. It was a real blast and a real good opportunity for us to connect uh, with the community. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to yeah, thank you guys for that. Uh, as I share that, I also want to mention that due to the rain we're going to get this afternoon, we are not going to be doing our community in the park uh, picnic this afternoon. We will postpone that to a later time, and you will, uh, you'll find out about it in the coming weeks. Sorry about that. We actually had to make that decision on Friday, and on Friday there was a 90% chance of rain starting at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, now they're pushing that back a little bit, so it's going to probably be one of those moments where we go, well, we could have done it, but uh, uh, we, we wanted to make the wise choice when we had to make a, a decision a few days ago. So let's do this. We are in the second week of a series called The Invisible War, and uh, I'll talk to you about it in just a moment. Let's pray and talk to God about this as we get our minds and our hearts focused. Jesus, help me to teach well today. This is such an important and valuable topic. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would guide our thoughts and our minds, even the way we hear things, that your spirit would guide that. Protect our ears from the lies of the enemy. Protect our ears and our hearts from the opportunity, I guess, to, to, to become a blamer or to hold too much condemnation or to hold too much guilt. Help us, Lord, to understand the tactics of our enemy and to make sure that we handle ourselves well in this battle. Jesus, we trust you. Help me today to speak words of encouragement. And even when calling out something that might be wrong, Lord, help me to do it in such a way that is convicting and not condemning. We trust you. In your name we pray, amen. So I think today's a really important day. And as, as I told you last week throughout this series, we are somewhat uh, indebted to, we're very thankful for a book called The Invisible War, What Every Believer Needs to Know About Satan, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare. It's kind of a text that utilizes uh, the best teaching from Scripture, helping us understand how these kinds of things happen. And I'm going to be giving out copies of that book next Sunday. I've already got them. I just decided to wait until next week to pass them out. And so you can, uh, you can come. I think we're going to give away five or six at each, at each gathering and then we'll actually ask you to read it, and then feel free to give it to somebody else who, uh, who gets to read it after you, okay? 
Uh, what we studied last week, just to give you a little bit of a background for those of you who might not have been here, was the idea that there is an invisible war. We have to make sure uh, that we don't n- uh, overlook or forget to notice the invisible war that's around us. And if you don't mind, lead me through the next few slides. I just want to give everybody kind of an up, kind of updated what we did last week. Uh, the, next, the next one will be this. There is an invisible war. We're involved in an invisible war. And our foe is formidable. Satan is real. He's there. He's powerful. We should respect him, but we do not need to fear him. In fact, God guides us directly not to fear him. And ultimately, the reason we don't have to fear him is that his power is limited. Okay, Satan is not a god. Satan is not a deity. Satan's power is created by the one true God, limited by the one true God, and will one day forever and completely be demolished by the one true God. So as we follow him, we have no need to fear Uh, this Satan who has limited power, okay? Uh, Today we're going to deal with the reality that uh, not only do we need to know that there is an invisible war, but we need to learn how to appropriate God's protection for daily living. That's today's message. Next week we'll be dealing with learning to engage the enemy with spiritual weapons, Uh, and the fourth week we'll be utilizing God's means of deliverance when spiritually attacked. How How do you deal with the fact that you've been wounded by the enemy? How do you deal with that? So the first question is, how can we prepare ourselves for satanic attack. And (coughs) before I answer that, I want to just rant for a second, if you guys don't mind. As a very young pastor, uh, back in in the day, not now, (laughs) back in the day, in my early 20s, uh, I noticed some things. Uh, People were leaving the church in droves. Like, I grew up in a youth group with somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 teenagers. There were like 15 seniors in my youth group the year I was a senior, and four years later, out of about 15, there were two or three of us that still went to church. You know what I mean? Like just, it just shrunk like crazy. And so a real kind of burden hit me as a young guy, and I was like trying to find out, how do we stop this? How do we help connect with people? And here's what I did. I just started interviewing people, listening to people, and I, I found similar stories over and over. I'm, I'm, I'm looking back on it now with a little bit of a little tongue-in-cheek here, but, but it would go like this. Somebody would go, well, I went to church a bunch, but then I had this one Sunday school teacher, and, and this guy was mean. He was difficult, and he called out on me even though he knew I didn't like to do that, and he made me talk in front of people, and he, and he embarrassed me, and so I, as soon as I could, I got out of that place. I decided to get away from that guy, or I, I went to this church, and, and the choir director, the choir director did this thing. They had an affair, did something else, sold meth out of the trunk of their car after choir practice. I don't know, like, like they just, they just were, you know, they were a hypocrite. You know, they weren't the right person. Or I, I went to this one church and there was a deacon and, and the deacon did this or did that. And, and what ends up happening is I found that over and over and over, everybody had a story. See, we're from Western Kentucky where everybody used to go to church. <laughs> everybody at some point were connected somewhere. Everybody went to somebody's vacation Bible school. It just, it's just everywhere for the most part, a very high percentage of our culture were that, and yet only like 20 to 22% of the culture will be in any church this morning, okay? And so everybody's got a story. And the recurring reality that I heard over and over was that that story pointed blame at someone else. I would be in church, but they. I would be connected to church, but they. I would still go to church, but they. And so what happens is you develop a culture of people who say, I believe in Jesus. I read the Bible. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he saved me to a new life. And I'm not doing what he called me to do because of them, because of him, because of her, because of somebody else. And so me, as a young pastor, I took it hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. I believed every story. And so I thought, what we need to do is start a church where there won't be any problem people. If we could do that. So I like I heard, you know, like like I, you know, I I stopped going to church because my church had a business meeting where they got in a fight over the color of the carpet. And I'm like, how about a church with no carpet? Truthfully, I know a guy who was in a business meeting where they got in a fight over what brand of toilet paper to use. So I started a church that said, no toilet paper. Bring your own. B-Y-O-P. I don't know where that came from. I'm sorry. We set out on a journey to try to create a congregation, a church, where we would reach people who don't like church by taking away the things about church that they don't like. 
and trying to find a way to hone in on only the things that really, 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 really matter. And here's what I found. Here's what I found. We grew really fast. We had all kinds of people. We, our church grew to 200 people in a little over a year. It grew to 1,000 people in less than 10 years. And all of a sudden, I realized something. We started to reach people who were problem people. And they started bringing their problems with them. And now all of a sudden, you get where I'm going with this, right? Here's what I want to get out there. I want to throw at you this thought today that many of the things we're trying to avoid will not, cannot, never will be avoided because they involve other human beings. And when you get in a group larger than one, there will be challenges. And you and I have to remember and realize that in the world in which we live, we are in a war. Now, we're not just in a war in Afghanistan, and we're not just in a war in Iraq, and we're not just in a war with ISIS, and we're not just in a war with Al-Qaeda, but in a greater, longer-lasting, more very real, right here in the midst of Graves County, Kentucky, we are in a war with an enemy who wants to try and find a way to convince you That the God you trust doesn't know all that you think he knows. Or that the people God put you with are not nearly as valuable to your life as God said they were. Or that being a part of something that's a greater movement than just you or your family is not necessary. And so God points out the flaws of, uh, I'm sorry, Satan points out the flaws of others. Satan points out the times when you've been victimized or harmed. Satan points out the imperfections of the church in such a way that many of us go, well, that means I don't want to be around it anymore. And my encouragement to those who might be watching online and for those who are struggling with this individual thought right now as I'm talking about it is to realize that maybe your Sunday school teacher who sold crack is not your enemy. Maybe the person who liked the ugly color of carpet is not your enemy. Maybe the person who was a hypocrite is not your enemy. Maybe the enemy is someone who used the actions and behaviors of those people as well as your own flaws and struggles and insecurities and anger issues and such against you to take you out of God's people in order to prevent you from being part of what God wants you to be. Here's how it shows up oftentimes in our culture. Someone will go, well, I went to church and nobody talked to me. I mean, I sat there right in my pew with my arms crossed and my face frowny, and nobody talked to me at all. I'm not going back. You know, all around you are people going, that guy didn't talk to me. I don't know why that guy didn't talk to me. I don't understand why that guy didn't talk to me. And in the long run, we we walk into a situation with our emotional guns cocked, ready to say, I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And and oftentimes, if you're looking for a reason and you're in a battle with a living enemy who's speaking reasons to your mind, I guarantee you, you're going to find a really good reason not to do what the God who saved your soul told you to do. And so today we're going to look at how do we live this life despite the reasons, despite all the things we might see, how do we live this life and deal with the fact that we are in, a, in the midst of a battle, a war around us that involves us and involves so many things about us. How can we prepare ourselves for satanic or spiritual attack? Let's read Ephesians 6, verse 10 and following. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. If not, you can read from the screen. If you've got your phone on you and you want to flip it open to the Bible app, that's fine. Read right along with me here, okay? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That, by the way, was where we started with last week's sermon. That's just kind of a command that's generalized. It goes across the world. We're supposed to be strong, okay? 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's a specific command. So we're not only being strong, but now we're standing against the schemes of the devil. And then in verse 12, he gives us the reason. The reason we do that is that We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. No, your Sunday school teacher who sold crack is not the enemy. The person who liked ugly carpet is not the enemy. We're not fighting against people, not flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is our 
enemy. And then in verse 13, and this is this slides we're going to stay for scripture today, is therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. There are three pieces of clothing, the belt, the breastplate, and the shoes that we're going to talk about today. Here's what he's talking about. This is a Roman centurion. Best we can tell as we put something back together. You can see, obviously, his helmet and his shield, things we'll talk about on other days. But the three things that we talk about today are, first, the belt, second, the breastplate, the big piece of steel here, and then the sandals, which you can see on his feet. See, our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ, urgently commands us to pick up our spiritual armor and put it on. Why? Well, for the purpose of being fully prepared and enabled to withstand the dark times when the enemy will most certainly attack. In, in Ephesians 6, 14, after picking up the army in preparation, armor in preparation for battle, we are then commanded to consciously and vigorously make a decisive act to stand our ground firmly and fearlessly against the enemy's assaults as he seeks to deceive, accuse, and discourage us. In 14 and 15, the metaphor of the Roman soldier's armor, which protected him in battle, are given three specific pieces of armor to look at, where we must put on, we must put these on as believers as a prerequisite to standing firmly and fearlessly against demonic attack. Here's what I want you to understand. God has given you freedom, but he's also placed you in a dangerous area. In the midst of your freedom, God has gifted you that freedom, but then he's also told you how to live in that world. In other words, it was given to you, but you must now live it out. It was given to you, but you must now live it out. Here's a, an example best I can tell. This past Christmas, one of my children's grandparents gave them a quite interesting gift. Do you know those? I think they're Asian or Oriental. The, the, the puzzle boxes, you have to move like 17 different things on a box in order to get it to open up. You ever seen those? You have to slide this this way and slide this that way and twist this. It's like the thing long before there was a Rubik's Cube that kind of smart people did, you know? This is what it was. And then finally, when you get all the different little slides in the right place and the things are flipped correctly and everything's in the right place, all of a sudden the box opens. Well, this particular grandparent gave them cash, but then put it in that box and then gave them a tricked up, very difficult to open box with cash in it and said, here's your gift. Now, I'm sure there are other grandparents with this idea, and right now there are some of you going, that's what I'm doing. That's good. I like that. That's good. What my kids didn't know was on the very bottom of the box was the instructions on how to open the box, but nobody looked at that. Why would you look at that? They're just going like, uh, 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 uh. you know, like, what? there's cash in here. Like, going for try to figure out how do I get this done. Eventually, somebody thinks, instructions on how to open the box. See, it was already theirs. The gift was given. It's yours. But now I want to give you the word of God to tell you how to live it out, how to use it, how to have it. See, some of you have been like, I got a hammer. That's what I got. I would have gotten in that box. If I wanted in that box, I would have done that. See, that, that's not the, the point. The, the point is that the Lord gifts us with something, but then his word tells us how to have it. And today what I want to talk to you about is how do we have the freedom from the enemy? How do we have the victory over the enemy in the midst of a world filled with the enemy? Well, his word tells us. The truth is you can be granted freedom and then choose not to follow the directions and you will not live as if you are free. You can be granted freedom and then follow the directions and you will live free. Here are the three things that the scripture says. Having fastened on the belt of truth. This metaphor ultimately is, is, is kind of the critical thing. It's, it's very important for us to get this. It's critical to all the other things said because the belt in Roman armor is where all other things fastened. It fit tightly around your waist so that that which was below it was held up and that which is above it was held down. This is the thing that in some way gathered all other parts of the armor together. 
Now, the Bible connects the belt to truth. How in the world is truth connected here? Truth means it could be translated candor, sincerity, truthfulness, all rooted in the objective, re- objective reality of the truth of God. But in this text, I think it's more of a subjective, practical application of the openness and honesty and genuine things between God and man. What the scripture is saying here is that which will form everything else in your life depends on whether or not you are willing to be genuine and honest with God. Are you willing to be genuine and honest with other people? Will you be who you are? Or will you try and fabricate something else? Will you try and put a filter on everything? You see, Instagram was not the first to have a filter. Christians had that a long time before. Okay? Let me ask you what you think. You, you tell me. Uh, I, right here, the Word tells us that as Christ followers, one of our most important pieces of armor is honesty, genuineness, authenticity, truth. Okay? If that's true, you tell me. I'm not trying to be harsh, not trying to point fingers, but do you think that the American church is better described as people who are always genuine, authentic, and out there for you to see who they really are, or people who figured out how to play the game and look the right way in the right time so that everyone thinks they are a certain thing that they might not actually be? Number two, isn't it? It's number two. That's the, and I'm not pointing at anyone here. I'm just saying it's a struggle. It's a struggle for people who dedicate themselves to be authentic, to continue to be authentic. Because the honest reality is, am I right here? We want each other to think well of us. Like, like we do. Like we want each other to think that we're great parents. Like we want each other to think that we're great at being married. We want each other to think that we're great at our jobs. We want each other to think that we're great at handling money. We want each other to think that we're great at serving in church. We want that. We are worried that if people thought other of us, that it would in some way hurt us or set us back. And therefore, we are tempted with the great temptation that the enemy uses to harm us in this area. And that would be to wear the belt of plastic, inauthentic, not genuine, not real personhood. Do you want to go to battle with a plastic belt on? Think about this for a second. I, 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 did, I did not have the benefit or the pleasure of being in the military, but I'm a huge fan of, and most of the TV shows I like are military-based shows. And can you imagine, like, the Navy SEALs? You know, like, they're, they're going to, like, dive out of an airplane and then land in the ocean and then swim into the, the banks of some other country. They're going to sneak six or eight of them in. They're going to go in, and they're going to get the baddest dude on the planet, and they're out there with, like, plastic belts on. Like, I got my plastic belt on, dude. I got it at Walmart. It's awesome. Click. You know, no, they're not wearing plastic belts. See what I'm saying? They're not doing that. But, but in realistic reality, sometimes we are. We fabricate a plastic, not real personhood, and we become that. On I know this is true because I've been around people who didn't know I was a pastor, and then I've been around them after they found out I was a pastor, and all of a sudden their entire vocabulary changes. I'm, I'm like, sometimes it's outrageously funny. Sometimes it's like some dude like, hey, dude, you see that girl? Oh, my gosh, did you see them? I'm like, yeah. What do you do for a living? I'm pastor of community fellowship. Holy Lord Jesus, Lord God in heaven. Thank you, for your, thank you for your creation and all the wonderful things. I, just a second, brother. Before I say any of the word, I just need to read my scripture for the day. You see what I'm saying? I'm not making this up. Like, I'm really not making this up. This is reality. I've said before, the one thing I will never tell you I do if we meet on an airplane is I will never tell you that I'm a pastor because I hate sitting beside people on an airplane that know I'm a pastor because everybody gets real religious and they drive me stinking nuts. You know? I like to say things like, I'm a motivational speaker. <laughs> you know? I lead a 501c3. That's cool. I, I don't lie. I just find a nice way to say something not 
preacher, not at all. Because we're not true people sometimes. And the quickest way to be someone who claims to be a Christian, but to be kicked in the face by Satan every day is to live two lives. The quickest way, the quickest way is to live two lives, to have church dude on Sunday and then everybody else throughout the rest of the week. And then you're wondering why you don't feel protected by the Holy Spirit. You're wondering why God's promises have not come true in your life because you haven't done what he told you to do and you can't get in the box because you won't follow the directions. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to be honest. Okay? God gave us something that we are then supposed to live out. Now, here's what you got to get, okay? You got to understand that we're in a, a, a battle that is, that is invisible, but is real. And there are a few things about your enemy you need to understand. Your enemy's goal, one of them, is to cause you to stay in hiding, to cause you to live in denial, and to cause you to find a way to shift the blame on somebody else. All of us, like I've never heard anybody, I've never, like not one time has someone come to me and go, I used to be active part of the church, but then I sinned and I hurt some people and I got embarrassed. And because I sinned and because I was embarrassed, I quit going to church. But that's the story I see happen all the time. But nobody ever says that. It's always like well, somebody didn't like the color of the carpet and they got mad at me and they weren't nice to me and I didn't like the way they taught that. Sunday school lesson or whatever. And so we live in hiding, we live in denial, and we shift the blame on somebody else. But here's the problem. You can't deal with somebody else's sin. You can deal with yours. Jesus and you can deal with yours. You can't deal with somebody else's behavior, somebody else's choices, somebody else's attitudes, but you can deal with yours. And if you wear the belt of truth, you live a genuine, honest life. That's a good place to start. Greatest piece of advice, I think maybe greatest piece of advice anybody ever gave me, one, one leader to another, he sat down with me and he said, you need to understand something, Brad. Some people sin on the front porch where everybody sees it and it's obvious. And other people sin on the back porch surrounded by a privacy fence, making sure nobody sees it. Beware the guy with the privacy fence. He's the one you can't, he's the one you can't really, really can't trust. I would so much rather somebody go, I have a flaw. This is my flaw. I, I, I'm, I'm caught up in sin. I am struggling. I've given in to struggle. This is it. This is where I'm at. So much rather somebody go, Lord Jesus, this is me. I am jacked up. I am messed up and I do not deserve you. That's the kind of person that receives some pretty amazing amounts of grace right there. Because he's come to Jesus with truth, honesty. I don't want to kneel at the altar with somebody who's going, Jesus, just, I just wish my mom had been nicer, and I just wish that my cousin had not done this, and I just wish that my pastor had been a better preacher, and I just, because if any of that would have happened, I would have followed you. Well, that's jack. That's ridiculous. We have to live out truth and be responsible for us. And other people have done bad things. Other people have harmed us. Absolutely, that's not the point. The point is that we are living this life. And God is saying to us, if you want to be protected from the enemy, then start from a place of authenticity and truth and genuineness. Don't hide. Don't deny. Don't blame. Be. That's the belt of truth. The second thing is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is, is probably my favorite thing to get to talk about, at least in this message. The metaphor is, is like this. The, the, the breastplate covered more than just the midsection, by the way. It went from the neck all the way down to the belt. And so it was also known by many as the heart protector. Uh, in other words, the breastplate's job was when you are face-to-face -face with your enemy, it assumes that, by the way, there's no back to the breastplate, just the front. When you're face-to-face -face with your enemy, the breastplate protects all your vital organs, okay? protects everything that you have to have other than your face to stay alive. He calls it, in this text, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness is something that you know, could be translated like uprightness, genuineness, uh, right living, integrity. Those are lots of different things. Character, all of those things. But we know from the New Testament that righteousness is not only a way someone lives. Before that, righteousness is a gift given by God. You are gifted your righteousness. So here's how it works. 
When grace happens in your life, God gives you righteousness. He gifts it to you. But then you have it. And now that you have righteousness, you can live righteously. That's why we should never expect someone who's not a believer to act like they are. We should never have a morality that says, even if you're not a Christian, you better act like one. That's, that doesn't make any sense. Someone who's not been gifted righteousness is not going to live righteously. They're going to live the way their sinful self lives. But someone who has been gifted righteousness now has the freedom to live in righteousness. But a lot of times that's not what happens, is it? A lot of times we mess up. A lot of times we make mistakes. A lot of times we fall short. Okay, so let's put it this way. So 25-year-old, full of sin, crazy guy, okay, meets Jesus one day. He doesn't just get out of bed the next day and go, I'm never sinning ever again. Therefore, I'm going to walk around. There's a pretty girl. I got a holy brain. Well, there's a whole lot of money. I got a holy thought. There's an opportunity to steal something. I have a holy mindset. It's not really the way it happens. What ends up happening is full of sin, crazy guy at 25 meets Jesus. Something ridiculously amazing happens in his soul and his spirit. Something comes to life that was dead before. And now all of a sudden, he's in the midst of that same sin that he would have so loved to be a part of yesterday. In the midst of it now going, something doesn't feel quite as right. Something is a bit different. I'm going to talk to my my friend who's also a Christian. And that Christian friend's going to say, yeah, because that's sin. You don't need to do that. And he's like, okay, cool. I'll work on that. I'm not going to do that anymore. But it might be years and years and years before he even really begins to discover all of the different things about his life that God is changing. And so you could be a Christian for five years or 10 years or 20 years, and you look back over choices you've made, and you find yourself regretting some of those choices, right? I have lots of decisions I've made, choices I made that I wish I hadn't made, or I wish I'd made them differently. The issue comes down to this. How will you handle your own flaws as you live life? Because I'm going to tell you how Satan will handle them. Satan is not only one who wants to lie to you, which we dealt with in the beginning, but now Satan is beyond that in that he wants to accuse you. He wants to point out that which is wrong in you. Satan wants to try and fill you with condemnation and guilt. And the greatest thing Satan could do in the midst of a believer who's struggling with choices and morality and those kinds of things is to fill them with accusation, fill them with guilt, and fill fill them with condemnation. Listen to me. All across the country, all across the world, there are people who think that the church made them feel guilty. The church made me feel guilty. The church made me hate myself. The church made me not like things about me. And what they don't realize is that it wasn't the church that was making them feel guilty. It's the enemy of the church that was filling them with accusation and guilt. Now, I'm not going to say that somebody in the church didn't have a voice that sounded more like Satan than Jesus, because that's quite possible and happens all the time, even among well-meaning people who don't realize that their words sting with accusation and condemnation more than they might have attempted or intended. You see, listen. As a Christ follower, you've been given righteousness. You've been given it. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus bought your righteousness. And Jesus gave you 100% fully all of the righteousness that you need for the rest of your eternity. But now from that position of having righteousness, you're learning to live righteously. And in the midst of doing so, you're going to have to remember where your righteousness comes from. This is where theology gets really important, folks. Because you see, if you think that you gained your salvation by acting good, you'll be quick to realize that you lost it by acting bad. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus gained your righteousness by dying on the cross for you, and that he did so to gain you an eternal, secure reality that you can live out. And in the midst of your mistakes... When flaming arrows of accusation, words like you're not good enough, you don't deserve this, you don't match up, you don't measure up, you're worthless, those kinds of things coming from Satan toward you land upon a thick and strong breastplate of righteousness where your response is, you know what? I wasn't good enough, but Jesus saved me and he's good enough. 
And so you could take that arrow right back. It hits and bounces. It hits and bounces. It hits and bounces because I don't have to let that cut me because Jesus made me righteous. Jesus made you, if you're a believer, righteous. Little Carly over here, Jesus made her righteous. I guarantee you, you talk to her mama and daddy or Sunday school teacher and you'll find an unrighteous story. But Jesus made her righteous. Okay? Jesus made her righteous. And for the rest of her life, even when she's flawed, even when she messes up, even when she makes the wrong decision, she can move forward knowing that nobody, nobody gets to hold guilt and condemnation over her because Jesus made her righteous. If you forget that and you choose not to wear that breastplate, you'll live your life with all kinds of shame that God never intended for you to have. You'll live your life with all kinds of guilt and all kinds of depression that God never intended you to have. You're not having it because God's not protecting you. You're having it because you're not putting on the righteous armor that God told you to wear. Making sense? That's the breastplate of righteousness. See, Satan's attacks are not merely deception, but they're accusation of believers resulting in guilt and condemnation. The next thing is this, the sandals, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The metaphor is this, Roman sandals were tightly strapped to the entire lower leg like those funky cool girl boots where they wrap the leather all the way around, it comes all the way up to the knee, right? That's what they were. These things were not slipping off, they weren't coming off, they weren't going anywhere. They were planted and on the bottom of the foot of the soldier, and they caused the soldier to be planted to the ground. Many Roman soldiers' boots even had nails coming out of the soles, focused backward toward the heel, similar to track or cross-country shoes that runners wear now in order to give themselves more what? Traction or grip, that's right. That's kind of the point. Why in the world would we need that? The reason we need that is that Satan not only uses deception and condemnation to neutralize believers, but he also specializes in casting doubt. I'm casting doubt on the very basis of God's goodness or the means by which they received it. Am I really saved? Was I really, did I do it right? Did I pray it right? Did I say it right? Have I done, some, done something so bad now that it doesn't work anymore? The gospel, Satan attacks grace coming at the gospel, and the scripture tells us that we need to have our feet grounded in the gospel so that we understand it for our own life and we understand it to share it with others' lives. So he will cast out, he will cause fear, and ultimately, the enemy's goal there is to cause you to look elsewhere for life, to get on a different path, to go down a different road. Now, let me share this. I know one of the things that for many church members in America is very hard to understand is, why does that pastor speak out against that pastor? It can be a hard thing. Sometimes that can be way out of line, very difficult. But like, why does, why does my pastor not like it when I watch a television program with that pastor? Why does, why does my pastor think it's unwise that I read a book by that leader or that guy? I'm not throwing names out. I'm just saying, why, why would he care? It's still Christian, isn't it? It's still church good stuff, right? It's still, well, let me talk to you about this. One of the reasons why we need to make sure that we have a solid and complete understanding of the gospel, not just in our brain, but in our heart, in our life, the scripture goes as far as to say, in our feet, is that we want to make sure that the gospel we're following, the gospel we're living out, is the actual Jesus-filled biblical gospel, because there are many, many slightly different versions. Think about it. Satan doesn't come at us. Like, Has anybody ever knocked on your door and asked you to be a Satan worshiper? Like nobody's ever done that. Nobody's ever come up to me like horns coming out of their head and blood coming out of their mouth, you know, and like, hey, would you like to join our club? No, they have, have, they, have, have they you? I mean, like, oh, that she's like, I remember that day. No. No, like, no, that's never happened. Satan doesn't come at us with those obvious kind of, I want you to do something that's completely and totally in every way different than you expect life should be. No, but Satan fills the world with other Jesuses. Satan fills the world with other gospels that are just enough not the reality. Here's what I mean. You can hear a great sermon on you better live a righteous life, but if that sermon doesn't begin with Jesus gave you any righteousness you have, that's not the gospel. 
You hear me? That's just about being a good boy. It's just about behaving. Behaving will get you straight to the wrong place if you're not doing it out of a reality where God changed you. That's the gospel. Let me read this scripture to you, and I'm, I'm about to be done, you guys, I promise. A little worked up, a little excited. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4 says this. Paul speaking, okay, this is, this is the Apostle Paul right here. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims, guess what? Those weren't my words, it's the Bible. Another Jesus than the one that we proclaimed. Or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received. Or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted. See, this is the danger that the text is bringing out here. And it's not just this text. It's all throughout the New Testament. We have to be careful. We have to be careful of gospels with, with heavens without a cross. You know what I'm saying? We have to be careful of salvation without sacrifice. We have to be careful of devotion without commitment. We have to be careful of the kinds of things that just say, you know what? Pray this prayer, get dipped in this water, and then go be who you want to go be. You're, you're going to heaven. No, you're not. No, you're not. The gospel says that when God changes who I am, then who I am is changed. Therefore, I live not out of just remembering what happened on a day when I was eight, but you can look at somebody today and go, they're a believer. It's how God changed something in them. They're not perfect. They're not without flaw. They're living a life that's uh, contextualized with reality. They're honest about who they are. They mess up. They, they struggle. Sin doesn't disappear from their reality. But as a whole, this is a man or a woman who's following Jesus. Because one time, back in eighth grade or back at eight years old or whenever it was, Jesus miraculously changed their heart. And they got righteousness, which they can live with now. Any gospel, any gospel that makes following Jesus just about a three-minute thing that happened 25 years ago is not the gospel. It's something else. Let me tell you something. And I say this from personal conviction, okay? There are far too many of us who preach the gospel who get way too stoked about somebody making a decision to follow Christ. And there aren't nearly as many of us who lead the church who get stoked about a person who's been walking with Jesus 20 years, been walking with Jesus 30 years, 40 years, whose faith has continued and lived out and shown that whatever it was that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was genuine because look at them now. Look where they are. Look what devotion has shown up out of their life. This is what it means to follow Jesus and not fall prey to the enemy who would love to convince him, us, that he's not worth following, he's not worth dying for, he's not worth living for. His word is just sometimes true, and ultimately we don't have to give everything to him. Close with this thought. If you guys don't mind, we'll just go ahead and bow our heads. And I'm going to play some music and sing in just a second, but if you don't mind, just this thought. So many of us um, live with worry. What if we did something wrong when we were eight? What if we did something wrong? What if the fact that we, in the midst of following Jesus, we have struggled with sin? What if, what if the fact that we've, we face this or we face that? How do I have security? How do I have assurance? See, the reason why our feet need to be grounded in the gospel is that we need to never forget what it was that really saved us and what it is that really saves us and who it is that will one day before the Father save us. Romans 8, 37 and 8, I'm going to read over you and just, you would think, the Apostle Paul says of Jesus, he says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will be able to separate us from Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us 
to make sure that we know you, to make sure that we hear you. Father, guide us to follow you. Lord, we want the belt of truth so that we live out of genuine authenticity. We need the breastplate of righteousness so that we remember who we are because you said we were. And it doesn't matter what the enemy says. Father, ground us in the gospel so that we live it every day of our life, but we also have it to share with others. We trust you, Lord. Would you stand with us? And just for a short moment, Jen is going to lead us in singing. And, and I just encourage you to respond to the Lord. It may not be that anybody comes down front or anything. I don't know. Just, just right where you are, if you deal with authenticity, if you're just struggling, like, you know what, maybe I've, maybe I've just been faking something. Maybe I'm not, I'm not being honest with myself or with anybody else. Just talk to the Lord about that. Or maybe you think, you know what, I do feel a lot of guilt, a lot of condemnation. I really do feel a lot of accusation against me. And I need the Lord's help with that. Just take it to him. Take it to him. Maybe you're here, maybe you're here and you don't feel grounded in the gospel at all. You're thinking, I've gone to church a lot. I've heard sermons, but I don't understand this. I don't understand how this works or why it matters. Just talk to the Lord about it. Let's let this be a positive moment as his spirit guides us. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. Heavens are roaring. Praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can
want to tell you one or two quick things and then we'll head out. Thank you so much for that. Jen, that was wonderful. I, I had this moment where just out of the corner of my eye, I thought it was Jaden back here. And I was like, Jaden's about to lead the altar call. That's going to be cool. I was like that. But then it's such awesome. It was really great. Thank you so much. A um, couple of things you need to know. Uh, youth ministry is growing like crazy and they're taking a trip to St. Louis. Uh, it's in your handout. It's also at cfconnect.info. Uh, go there to, to make sure you know what's going on. Talk to your youth leaders and things for 7th through 12th grade. Uh, Edge, which is our ministry to 5th and 6th grades, just started a few months ago. You guys, this is just ridiculous. It's like we started with, we thought we were going to have 6 or 7 kids. Uh, we had 23 Wednesday night, just in 5th and 6th grade. Uh, just, it's, just, it's just beautiful what, what God is doing there. Uh, we're seeing lots of exciting things. They're taking a trip on October 29th to Beggs Family Farm. So uh, that also, you can go to cfconnect.info and find out uh, how to be a part of that. So uh, we'd love for you to, 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 to continue to grow and connect with the church. Attending on Sundays is beautiful, but, but beyond that, there are groups for you to connect with, people to develop friendships with, people who can share your life with you to help you grow and mature and live out that, in, you know, that inner uh, um, uh, kind of integrity or uh, genuineness that we've talked about today. And so, uh, so, so excited and thankful for you being here. Uh, the last thing I wanted to make sure you're aware of is that we are a regional hub for Operation Christmas Child. This is a ministry that we're a part of every year where we bless kids all over the world by filling this shoebox with things that they need as well as fun things they would love to have. And then we ship out uh, churches from all over the region, from like Princeton to uh, all the way up to, I think, Madisonville down to Hopkinsville are going to be bringing their stuff here. And in November, we're going to be loading somewhere between 20 and 30,000 of these boxes onto a couple of 18-wheeler truck box trucks uh, and sending them overseas. And so we're very thankful to be a part of this. Uh, it's run by an organization called Samaritan's Purse. And a uh, man by the last name of Graham in charge of that. You may have heard of him. Uh, it's just a really, really good thing. So uh, you can take one or more of these shoe boxes. They're flat, laying on a table straight through the exit there. You just fold it up, put it together, and there are instructions on the box what you can and cannot put in the box, okay? So like you cannot send a can of gasoline, for instance, to a child in a foreign country. Uh, those kinds of things will be scanned over, looked through. So make sure you only send what you can send. But uh, I think you've got two weeks to bring this in. I think you've got the next two weeks to bring these in, and we're going to send them over uh, uh, to do that. So thank you so much. We love you guys. Uh, have a fantastic week. We'll see you next week. Wow, what a great day we have had together at Community Fellowship. Even right now, if you're watching this live, people are still praying and they're still dealing with what it is that God is guiding them to do in their life. God's bringing healing and he's bringing relationships back together. Lots of exciting things. Maybe God's doing that in your life. And we wanna be helpful to you. As you respond to the Lord and continue following him, maybe we can help you further. Check out our website, cfbc.tv. Find out all the details, ways that you can connect. If you live in Western Kentucky, then come join us on a Sunday morning at one of our live gatherings. They're at 8.30 and 11, and we've got great Bible study for all ages at 9.45 in between the two. We're on Highway New, 40, New Highway 45 between Lone Oak and Mayfield. We'd love to have you any Sunday. Have a great week.